What better way to kick off a loosely history based channel than to start with a video on the beginning of history? When I say the beginning of history, I don't mean the start of time itself, no, I mean the beginning of how we understand and think about history. The way we approach history was revolutionized by Herodotus and his book creatively titled Histories. This book laid out the foundations of how we study and reason about the past. Herodotus' contribution to the field of history led famous Roman smart guy Cicero to give him the nickname the father of history. For someone who was as instrumental to the way we see history as Herodotus, we know surprisingly little about the man himself. His work only gives us limited details on his life and other ancient sources are few and far between and often contradict each other. What we do know for certain is that he was born in Halicarnassus in modern day Anatolia. Historians place his date of birth at around 484 BC, but the reasons for this are dubious at best. This would mean that Herodotus grew up as part of a Greek family in the Persian Empire, which could have influenced his later writings. After his birth, details become more vague. It is likely that his uncle, the poet Panyasis, died in a failed revolt against Halicarnassus' tyrant. This may or may not have caused Herodotus and his family to flee to the nearby island of Samos. In around 454 BC, Herodotus may or may not have returned to Halicarnassus, where he may or may not have participated in a now successful revolt. Around 444 BC, he migrated to Thurium in what is now southern Italy. His place of death is again unclear. Sources have placed it at Thurium, Athens or even Macedonia. It is not entirely clear where Herodotus spent the 10 years between his alleged revolt in Halicarnassus and his eventual move to Thurium, though it is clear that he travelled a lot in this time. His histories place him in Athens, Egypt, Libya, Mesopotamia, Babylon, the Black Sea and Scythia, among other places. It was during these travels that he picked up most of the stories he tells in his histories. It is unclear whether he travelled with the intent to write a book or just as a merchant. It is speculated that he initially just gathered unconnected stories and only later recognised how they fit together into a greater narrative. Whatever the case, it would turn into one of the most influential works of history ever written. Herodotus clearly states his intent for the book in the opening sentence. These are the results of the inquiry carried out by Herodotus of Halicarnassus, so that the things done by men may not be lost to time, and to ensure that the big and marvellous deeds done by Greeks and non-Greeks, and in particular the reason why they wage war on each other, may not be without fame. As this opening implies, the book covers a war between Greeks and non-Greeks. The non-Greeks in question are the Persians, and the war is the Greco-Persian War. I can't cover the entirety of the war in this video, but in short, Greek city-states under Persian control in Anatolia rebel with help from Athens. Persia squashes this rebellion and invades Athens and the rest of Greece as a punishment, but they get their ass kicked at the Battle of Marathon. Persia will try again a few years later, but they get their ass kicked once again. The details of the conflict are not important to this video, but if you do want to learn more, I don't know, just use Google or something. While the book is mainly known for its portrayal of the Persian Wars, it does so much more than that. Do you want to know about the previous 10 generations of rulers of any given kingdom? Do you want to learn about ants the size of foxes that dig up gold and hunt humans? What about that time that Periander put his bread in his dead wife's oven? Well, Herodotus has got you covered. Every time the Greeks or Persians meet a new kingdom or city, which is surprisingly often, the narrative pauses and we get a detailed overview of that place's history, leaders, culture, geography, local flora or fauna, or whatever else Herodotus might feel like telling. This makes the text read more like a travel guide than a history book at times. One of the major recurring themes in the book is power. Herodotus' view on power can be summarized in one sentence. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. According to Herodotus, every king, tyrant or despot, no matter how well-intentioned, will eventually be corrupted by power. The book is filled with anecdotes of various tyrants who get a little too power-hungry and eventually get killed in increasingly brutal ways. This view makes sense given what we know about Herodotus' bad formative experiences with tyrants. One famous example given by Herodotus is the Persian king Cambyses. On one occasion, his advisor Praxaspes tells him that some Persians perceive him to be a mad drunk. To this, Cambyses responds with, Oh yeah? Could a mad drunk do this? And he proceeds to shoot Praxaspes' son straight through the heart. Praxaspes was forced to agree that it was indeed a very impressive shot, though he was unsure how it disproved his madness. According to Herodotus, Cambyses would later die by falling off his horse onto his own sword. This idea of rulers overstepping their boundaries also ties in nicely with hubris. 
another important theme in the book. Although Herodotus is clearly against tyrannies, he is also not entirely sold on the idea of democracy. He does often praise it throughout his work, but he also gives criticism. When he tells of how Aristagoras seeks support from both Sparta and Athens for a rebellion, he knows that It seems that it is easier to deceive many than it is to deceive one. For he could not deceive the Spartan Cleomenes, who was alone, but he could deceive 30,000 Athenians. It was Athens' help in this rebellion that directly led to the start of the Persian Wars. While the contents of the book may be various degrees of interesting, that is not what makes Herodotus so special. You may have heard people say that Herodotus was the first historian, but this is somewhat misleading. Before Herodotus, there were the logographers, who wrote what some might consider history. They would write chronologies of peoples, families and countries, mixing real historical facts with more mythological tales. One of those logographers is Hecateus of Miletus. Often called the father of geography, Hecateus is most well known for his, for the time, surprisingly accurate world map. More interesting for us, he also wrote two books that may have directly inspired Herodotus. First was the Periodos Ges, which contained detailed descriptions of the geography and ethnography of Europe, Asia and Africa. The second was his Genealogies, which was a systematic ordering of Greek myths and legends. What makes his second book so special is that Hecateus has a much more skeptical view of the stories he transcribes when compared with his fellow logographers. The book opens with the famous line, Hecateus of Miletus thus speaks, I write what I deem true, for the stories of Greeks are manifold and seem to me ridiculous. A good example of this is Hecateus' explanation for Cerberus. According to him, this was not actually a three-headed dog, but a very poisonous snake that earned the nickname the Dog of Hades because of its deadliness. This approach of separating myth from fact pioneered by Hecateus forms a bridge between the ancient traditions of the logographers and Herodotus. If Herodotus is the father of history, Hecateus might well be called the grandfather of history. If Herodotus wasn't the first historian, what was it that earned him that nickname? Well, he improved upon his predecessors in a few key areas. First of all, his work covered a much larger scale. Where logographers would concern themselves with one nation or family at a time, Herodotus looked at the entire known world. This allowed him to find international causal relationships. This finding of cause and effect also sets him apart from his predecessors. Where they were content with just writing down that something happened, Herodotus tried to find out why that something happened. Where logographers just attributed events to the will of the gods, Herodotus favored a more human explanation. Of course, gods still appeared in his histories in the form of oracles, dreams and dolphins, but events were by and large given a human cause, sometimes next to a divine one. Herodotus reached his conclusions through what he describes as opsis, akoe, historiae and nome, whereby seeing, hearing, inquiring and logical reasoning. That third word, historiae, is actually where the word history comes from. Whenever possible, Herodotus would go on location and look at the available evidence himself. If that was not possible, he would talk with locals who would either witness the event themselves or who knew stories about the event. He would then use logical reasoning to piece these pieces together into one coherent story. He would usually straight up tell where he got his information from. He would either give a general source, like the Persians claim or the Egyptians have a story where, or on occasion he would list a specific person or work. This is especially incredible, as historians to this day seem to struggle with naming proper sources. Despite the many leaps forward Herodotus made, he was obviously not without his flaws. His book is filled with claims that are at best slightly biased and at worst straight up wrong. One common example of misinformation in his book are the previously mentioned man-eating, gold-digging, fox-sized ants. It might surprise you to learn that such creatures did not actually exist. If they are not real, then how did they end up in Herodotus' work? Modern scholars have actually offered an explanation for this. While these ants didn't exist, marmots that are known to dig up gold did. The Persian word for marmot was quite similar to the word for ant, so it would be an easy mistake to make. This still does not explain the manhunting bit, as marmots are not known to eat people. While this mistake may be somewhat explainable, it does point to a larger issue in Herodotus' work. He relates stories as he hears them, without any form of fact-checking. The man himself said, the Egyptian stories may be believed by whoever finds them believable. The rule that I have followed for my entire work is that I write down 
everything that anybody tells me. While his intentions here were noble, it has resulted in a book that mixes genuine historical facts with biased accounts and outright fiction. This in turn diminishes the book's reliability as an actual historical source. While there is certainly a place for these stories, a historical book is not it. These local legends and biases do however give us a valuable insight into the cultures of the ancient Greek world, which is also very valuable in its own right. And Herodotus was not only criticized by modern historians with the benefit of hindsight, far from it. One of his most well-known critics was actually a contemporary of his, Thucydides. Thucydides was an historian and has arguably had a bigger impact on how we record history than Herodotus himself. While the two of them shared a profession, their similarities end there. As a historian, Thucydides was basically the polar opposite of Herodotus. While Herodotus lay out both sides of the story and made the readers decide who to believe, Thucydides examined the sources himself and only showed his conclusions. Where Herodotus relied on information provided by others, Thucydides mostly relied on his own observations. Where Herodotus told stories in terms of peoples, cultures and geographies, Thucydides was only interested in politics and war. While it is debatable which of these approaches is better, it does explain why Thucydides was so critical of Herodotus. While he never directly names Herodotus, the beginning of his book The Peloponnesian War criticizes his predecessors, among which Herodotus is the most noteworthy. The main point levied against him is that he is more concerned with telling a good story than he is in actually finding out the truth. Herodotus would, according to him, take exaggerated stories from every fool he came across without actually evaluating them, purely for the sake of entertainment. He ends his opening statement with The absence of romance in my history will, I fear, detract somewhat from its interest. I have written my work not as an essay which is to win the applause of the moment, but as a possession for all time, clearly trying to set himself apart from his predecessors. Thucydides was not his only critic. Many Greeks seem to have a bone to pick with Herodotus. Aristoteles dismissed him as just a storyteller, Plutarch accused him of being biased, calling him a barbarian lover, and Strabo said that you would be better off going to Homer than Herodotus if you are looking for historical facts. Ouch. Despite all of this, Herodotus was still incredibly popular in the ancient Greek world, be it because of his accurate histories or just because of his talent for storytelling. And while he may have been criticized for being inaccurate, many of his tales have now been proven correct by archaeological findings, so it wasn't all bad. And yes, his work may have been a little rough around the edges, but what did you expect? The man basically invented a new genre of writing and a new scientific discipline. Of course everything wasn't going to be perfect right away. Most of his successors, including Thucydides, have suffered from the same biases and inaccuracies they ridiculed Herodotus for. And historians to this day follow the historic method that he pioneered. So all in all, Herodotus definitely deserves to be known as the father of history. Thank you for watching, I've been Thomas, and I hope to see you next video where I mispronounce a bunch of French names. Hiya!